Richmond adopt the London living wage for all their contractors and we are procuring jointly, it makes sense for Wandsworth to join the majority of London boroughs and pay a fair day's pay for a hard day's work. Um, <laughs> Councillor Kavindia. Um, I thank Councillor Hogg for his supplementary. Well, I do refer to it because it's all in printed uh, uh, answer. Uh, I think I was reminded not too long ago by one of your side that it was not necessary for me to read out what is already printed because you guys can read, but obviously you can't. So I will at some, op some future point try and read question answers to you. But let me just turn to two things. One is that the proposal that you put forward in this question would have a cost implication for this council. And what you don't do, as you never do, is to find a way in which you might balance the books. You never tell us what the expenditure would be and how that expenditure would be funded. That kind of irresponsible attitude to money is why you are where you are and we are where we are. Supplementary. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you. O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, Acknowledging the um, vote responses um, of the leader, I would, I would ask him, though, if he would reaffirm our commitment to work constructively and collaboratively with Richmond in respect of procurement um, strategy generally, but also to seek the same commitments from the leader of Richmond Council, particularly when um, passing motions before they may have done the work in order to cost those motions, and that may have an effect on us as a council. Um, I thank Councillor Green for his uh, supplementary. I, I, I'm absolutely confident that uh, Councillor Roberts in, in Richmond will behave as responsibly as a leader of council needs to, and he will do. So don't have a problem with him on that kind. But as for his kind of key point about procurement and joint procurements, the whole idea of the SSA is to, in fact, drive savings through economies of scale, of which uh, joint procurement is one. But you know, there are experts in procurement in this chamber. I mean, they advise their private clients on a daytime basis. Uh, they will know that you can procure anything and at multi-layered approach. You can take a multi-layer approach to procurement. You can have different specifications. In fact, this council itself, as a single authority, has different specifications for different parts of the borough on, for example, the street cleansing contract. You can prescribe what is it that you want to buy and the market will provide the price for it. So there is no great mystery in having different sovereign approaches to our, our, our way of running our boroughs and still find the market responding to it constructively and economically fairly. Question Council number Mrs. Jane Cooper. Question number three to the leader. Uh, I thank Councillor Mrs. Cooper for her um, question. I think this is, um, there's been a quite a lot of publicity about our position on Heathrow. And the critical thing for all of us to note is that there was a time when we thought that the Heathrow noise uh, pollution was mainly a, a north of the borough problem. Well, no more, really. What Heathrow has very clearly said, that it is going to affect every part of this borough and beyond. So the noise that wasn't there in Tooting is coming to Tooting. And those who have the noise now in north part of the Battersea will have more noise. So it is a bit like Heathrow's idea that those who have noise shall have more and those who have none will have some. Supplementary, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Cooper. Jane. Thank you. Can I thank the leader for his update and can he update us on what other steps the council is taking to block Heathrow expansion in addition to our joint legal action in the High Court. Thank you, Councillor Cooper, for a supplementary. I mean, it is based on well, our, our, our very firm belief that the High Court action will deliver us the outcome this time as it did last time. It is the firm belief of our partners that we, we have right on our side. And more particularly, some of the green lobby groups who are partners with us in this High Court action have very clear belief that what government is embarked on is not only wrong, but also illegal. So I, ha I have every, every hope that at the end of this uh, uh, High Court action, we shall once again be the winners. Second supplementary. 
Thank you. I share the horror, as we all do, I think, about the fact that there will be the exposure, that there will be more flights over a much wider area of our borough. They will be lower and louder, and the creeping extension of flight times as well. You have outlined some of the additional things that you'll be doing to lobby. Could I ask you to add the political pressure? This is a Conservative government's choice to bring this um, runway here. So what are you doing to add the political pressure on the Prime Minister and the Transport Minister to make sure that we don't get that third runway at Heathrow? I, I thank Councillor Anderson for her supplementary. I mean, I, she, well, of course she's right. That is a political issue because it was a political issue when her party took a view about Heathrow, which we opposed. And my party has taken a view about Heathrow, we oppose. What is very clear on our side, and always have been consistently clear on our side, is that we put the interests of Wandsworth residents first, irrespective of which party is in control at centre. Councillor Gilbert. Question number four to the leader, please. I thank Councillor Gilbert for her question. Um, one thing I would simply say is that our going to the court for clarity on what is it that we can do and stay within the law shouldn't really frighten her, nor should it frighten the residents. That's what the courts are there for. They're there to create clarity and they're there to clear, create certainty. So one shouldn't see going to court for clarity as some sort of a threat or some sort of a malevolent desire on behalf of this council. As far as safety issue is concerned, it is clear by a mile that say expert after expert after expert has said that sprinklers provide a greater certainty of safety than any other device. And in fact, the answer lists at least three members of her party, including her party leader, who have very clearly stated as to what their position is about sprinklers and safety for people who live in, 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 in the local authority housing. Supplementary. Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. I hadn't realised until this evening how Trumpian the leader of this council is in referring to fake news. I would invite him to show me the fake news that anyone on this side of the chamber has been perpetrating on sprinklers. I, I invite the leader of the council to recognise that the council's legal advisers have already been embarrassed in this process and he, he seems intent on continuing. He some, seems to also have failed to realise that the application I made is based on residents' views, they are not my views, and I'm very familiar with the court process, thank you. He also doesn't recognise that the, the application makes no reference to the substance of the policy, it is merely about process. Uh, I would invite him to yeah. recognise, I have a question Mr Mayor, I'd invite him to recognise that he would know exactly what this, this group has said on sprinklers if any councillor of the 33 had attended the hearing in October or any of the open uh, meetings Councillor and I would Gilbert, invite him can to you put answer, the question please? I would invite him to answer why it is, if he's so familiar with the court process, that they cannot, you cannot apply for a stay if indeed Gren the Grenfell Inquiry does come up with something relevant on sprinklers. Mr. Mayor, I thank Councillor Gilbert Council for Green a supplementary. The short answer to her long question is, we as a council ask lawyers to deal with our legal matters. We don't trust our legal matters to councillors, whether they are legally qualified or not. And I rely on the, on the advice of our external legal advisors who have taken us down this course, and I'm sure they're right. Second supplemental. Councillor Morgan. Uh, can the leader tell us whether we've had any further correspondence with the APPG on fire safety, as this is an important matter of safety. Surely if they can reach an agreement and find common ground, so can we as a council. I thank Councillor Morgan for his supplement. He raises, in a sense, two, two, two things. One is about safety and the other is about reaching common ground across uh, the political divide. Can we, let me deal with the second one first. I've been a member of this council for a very long time now, and it's always been the case that there has always been a back-channel conversation between this side and that. And that back-channel conversation has been based on trust and understanding of each other's position, and also the undying belief that we are both all here to do best we can for our residents. Sadly, since May, that 
trust and that back-channel conversation is almost non-existent. And in that situation, I think this very important and important for not only our residents, but for us and for our peace of mind that we are diligently discharging our duty to our residents, uh, that back-channel has collapsed, and that is unfortunate. And I only hope that more responsible members on, on, on that side will reflect on this and, and, and accept that for the next three and a bit years, they are where they are, we are where we are, we are going to have to cooperate, talk to each other, and do the best we can for our residents, despite our differences. Turning to, to, to his other point about security, extraordinarily important matter was raised by w Councillor Grimston in his letter to the APPG, and the APPG replied to him, but also copied it to all of us, or certainly to the council. It's a very clear letter, and it, sh it is written by a fire expert professional who says that his motivation after retirement to going into this job was his undying belief that there are ways in which fire tragedies can be avoided, and he wanted to play his role in avoiding fire tragedies. He picks, off, picks on the lessons of Lacanon, which again were very clear, putting safety and security of residents at the heart of any future action that a local authority could and should take. He also engaged, obviously, in some correspondence or conversation with Councillor Grimston. And he sort of says, and I'll read this bit out, saying, notwithstanding, I do take seriously some of the reasons you have given for opposition given by residents to the installation of automatic sprinkler protection. There are many myths about sprinklers which sensible dialogue can overcome, such as that premises being flooded when toast burns. There also need for a dialogue about ensuring safe building from fire were exceptions to be made for the live individual fl flat tenants or owners who do not desire to have that protection. I think this is a very important, a clear letter from a fire professional putting his professional experience on the line saying he is, has got undying belief that it is sprinklers that would save lives. And his sentence is just very important for us as, as local authority responsible individuals. If Grenfell Tower had been fitted with automatic fire sprinkler protection, it is most likely that this tragic loss of life would not have occurred. When a man is as clear as that, it is wrong for us to dilly-dally on what is going to be extraordinarily important for the safety and security of our tenants. The Whips have agreed that paragraph two of report number one, council tax requirement and council tax for 2019 stroke 20 will be taken next. I now move reception of that report and paragraph. Can I ask councillors Gibbons and Wintle to move and second the circulated amendment in their names? Thank you. I will move the amendment formally. Seconded. Councillor Mrs. Sutters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'm delighted to open this debate. But I've been thinking that some of the opposition's commentary is making me feel that we are somehow looking to cause a seismic downward shift in the finances of our residents tonight by voting to raise council tax. But actually, I don't think we are. And that we are somehow out of kilter with other councils in proposing an increase which I understand we are not, and I don't think we are. However, I'm not going to concentrate on why we will still be offering brilliant value for money, because I know Councillor Gibbons will have more than enough to say to the contrary later on, and Councillor Celia will be more than capable of responding to the points brought forward on financial matters. I'm going to concentrate on some of the things that I believe should be delivered. They're not statutory, but we need the money to do so. There are many initiatives in my portfolio that, prom that promote social progress, social mobility, and social inclusion. Or put it another way, and borrow phraseology from my friends in the opposition, we are all about initiatives that work for the many, not the few. And we do this by leveraging the offer in our libraries, the arts, culture, heritage, and parks 
as well as subsidised and targeted sports programmes that boost residents' sense of well-being, both mental and physical. I'm only going to have time to go through a couple of things, but I'd be really happy to talk to anybody outside of this chamber as to why I feel so strongly about this. Firstly, libraries. We do have the best public libraries in London, as highlighted by the answers to some of the questions. Thank you. And the endorsements given by residents in response to our Get to Know Your Library campaign, which were truly moving. One of my favourites was made by Trevor Vickers, a volunteer, who said, if you're lonely, there is always someone to talk to. It's like a community centre, and I've met loads of people just by being here for a couple of mornings a week. And I think that's fantastic. So from tackling social isolation, providing entertainment, to promoting reading and knowledge, I can assure you all that Wandsworth is at the top of its game. And at the time when other boroughs are cutting back, and we've said this so many times, but it is true, we are now in the process of creating a library service of the future, building new facilities, looking at a new library strategy, and building those facilities in important locations, including our regeneration schemes, forging new links to our communities, and widening accessibility through an ever diverse program of events. I look forward to sharing the, the, um, more on this with you in times to come. And the second thing I would like to highlight is sport. I want to talk about sports initiatives that play to social cohesion. As we all know, we're in the progress of regenerating in Battersea and Roehampton. And whilst this is good news overall, it can be an unsettling time for young people. I'm actually from the frozen north, and I remember when they knocked down the back-to-backs, so I'm really well aware of what it does to a childhood. And young people can start to feel disconnected when faced by major construction in their home patch. They may lose their friends who move, or maybe they're waiting themselves to be relocated to better and smarter accommodation that better suits their family circumstances. So it's really important that we, we make our young people feel supported through this process that they retain a sense of belonging, a sense of place throughout the period of change. And one way that you can do this is through sport. Um, and I've been working with officers and enable to review what is on offer in both of those locations to see whether we can use team sports in this way, and I think we can. In Battersea, evidently there's lots in place, which is good to hear. But in Roehampton, we have a deficit. So we will be looking to strengthen the offer and make sure there's something that every young person can buy into. And finally, but no means least, a little initiative down in Fursdown, the, ki the Kick the Fat project, which I don't know if many of you have heard of it. I just love this one. Now in its fourth week, men and women with a BMI of over 30 are playing five-a-side football and gaining goals, not special shooting the ball, but on the pitch. They have the benefit of a nutritionist, regular weigh-ins, and blood pressure checks. Many tell me they have never really considered their relationship with food in the past, and they are valuing the companionship and the new knowledge that they are gaining. Because we all know that it was a thing in the past to put on a spread for whoever came to the house, and perhaps not to worry about what you were eating, but this can be very detrimental to your health. One particular resident who came forward was found to have a resting heart rate so high that he had to be sent straight to hospital. He was the father of two, yeah, well you might smile, Councillor Daly, but it was actually true, it was 180 resting heart rate, it's just ludicrous. He was the father of young children. It is not too far from the truth to say that I think we could possibly have saved his life by acting and by him coming forward. And I don't think a return on investment comes better than that. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Critchard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Local authority funding faces a crisis. You don't believe me? In March, 20, <coughs> excuse me, in March 2018, the National Audit, Audit Office said, as yet, there is no comprehensive long-term funding plan to address funding pressures. Just last month, the Public Accounts Committee said, the government is in denial about the perilous state of local finance. If local finances overall are in such a bad way, what does this tell us about adult social care? 
It's one of the big, biggest spend areas in most local authorities, and Wandsworth is no exception. The budget is nearly 100 million per annum. Our res residents are living longer, and people need support in their final years to have a comfortable, dignified life. <coughs> we live in a humane society and do not wish to see the elderly, frail, and vulnerable people living in poor conditions. This is an example, actually, of a policy that is for the few, not the many. And I'm sure that everyone in, our, in this chamber will agree with me about support for the older and frail person. But have you all examined the situation closely? Government policy from 2010 onwards has been to increase funding for local, area, local authorities in the areas they fund, including social services. Funding has fallen by 25% in real terms since 2011. And by 2015, it became clear that despite efficiency savings of around 10%, local authorities did not have sufficient funds to ensure that all their residents got the care they needed and deserved. That's when the Chancellor introduced a three-year social care precept to help support social care. That precept this year will bring in around £1.1 million for this authority. Let's put a spotlight on Wandsworth. This year, the Social Services Department had a cash injection of £5.25 million to avoid overspending. The leader has just told us that the party opposite is extremely good at balancing the budget. budget. I don't really consider that balancing a budget with a £5.25 million overspend is a good example of this. There's a recovery Mayor, plan. A point of uh, personal explanation, Mr Mayor. Uh, no. Uh, can't. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> I am, Councillor I am I'm afraid you've got to, entitled, got to allow, the, to the, allow the leader to um, put his point. Uh, whether it's acceptable right or not is another speech. matter. My, my, point, uh, my, my point about Councilor balancing Gabinia. budget was that you cannot take £1.7 million out of the budget, not find a solution to how you make up the gap. That's called not balancing the budget. That's what you're doing. <laughs> Councillor Critchard. Okay. Let me pick it up. There is a recovery plan in place to bring the social services budget back into line by 2021-22. Uh, However, none of the recovery actions have marked clear savings. Certainly no savings have been outlined in any papers to the adults OSC. The leader commented recently, the recovery plan is on track. That's in the answer to another question. But, so, but if that meant so far we've started a few projects that might make a difference, but we've got no idea if it's going to work, then perhaps the plan is on track. I seem to remember that Children's Services had a recovery plan. That's cost 37 million and counting. Wandsworth's track record on recovery plans is not great. So if we take the social services precept, then maybe we can help with 20% of the budget gap. Maybe. And that assumes that the funding gap doesn't increase as people go, get older and require more care. In June 2018, the Joint Committee on Funding of Social Care concluded the social care system is under unsustainable strain. In its present state, the system is not fit to respond to current needs, let alone demographic trends. I don't want to ask re residents for extra money for social care. I don't want to add to a regressive tax burden. I don't want to ask residents to plug a hole that this Tory government has willfully ignored. But if that is the only possible way to get a little extra for our elderly and vulnerable residents, I've got to do it. However, I want all residents to understand that this has to be done because the Tory government has failed in its 2017 election promise to bring long-term sustainable funding to adult social care. This government has failed and the residents of Wandsworth are being asked to cover up for Tory failings. This is neither fair nor right. I hope councillors on the opposite benches can be honest with the public and explain that their council tax will be increasing as a result of this government chasing a unicorn of reducing budget deficits. I therefore ask members to support the Labour amendment to free the freeze the council tax and only take the social care precept. Thank you. Councillor Fluck.